Good afternoon, everyone, and I'm thrilled to be at Shastra today. We have an awesome panel. Uh, we're going to talk about trends, opportunities with generative AI. Uh, just uh, before I introduce the panel, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm managing director. I lead uh, the global AI, uh, Gen AI, Black Belt team. So this is a customer engineering team. Um, as far as our, our panelists go, we have an awesome panel of two of our startups that are part of our Google for Startups Cloud program and our VC partner from Innovation Endeavors. Um, I would like to uh, you know, introduce uh, the panel to have an opportunity to introduce yourself. So let's start with Lillian. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Lily. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of LegalOS. Um, I'm actually an anthropologist by training, but I've been working at the intersection of law and tech for the past four years. Um, LegalOS, we're building an AI-powered powered legal assistant for um, revenue, build, revenue driving functions. So um, offering legal support on demand for those teams in Slack, in MS Teams, or in Salesforce. Um, so, for example, answering privacy questions, uh, drafting emails in response to um, pushback on the SLA or vendor forms, etc. We're Berlin-based, um, and we work with scale-ups and enterprises all across Europe and the US. Yeah, hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. I am Sarah. That's me. I am the co-founder and the COO of Ultimate. And we've been building Ultimate for about six years now, and we're about 170 people across Berlin, Helsinki, and London. And Ultimate is a customer service automation platform powered by AI and generative AI specifically. And brands from you know, Foot Locker to Finnair and Zalando to Zendesk, they use us to build a bot that works as a core member of their customer support team and automates customer requests across all of their digital support channels. So that's messaging, email, chat, and at native fluency in every language. Awesome. Uh, hey, everyone. Good to meet you. Um, I'm Harpy. I'm with Innovation Endeavors. We are an early stage VC fund. It was actually started by Eric Schmidt when he was the Google CEO and one of my other partners, Drawer. And uh, we primarily invest in seed and Series A companies. Um, in two areas. One is AI applied to big physical world problems, so kind of problems that you two are solving, and also enterprise infrastructure, so machine learning, tooling, data infra, dev tools, areas like that. My background is mostly as an engineer and a founder. I was a founder for, for about 18 years. I started two companies, one in wireless infrastructure and second one in data analytics, um, and I led product and then I was a CEO at my companies. Um, and in addition to being at IE, I also teach at Stanford. I teach a couple of uh, entrepreneurship classes at Stanford GSP. Thank you, thank you, Harpy. Thank you, um, Lillian and Sarah. So Lillian, I would like to start with you first. As a startup, one of the more complex things is as you try to integrate generative AI into your product roadmap with the fast evolution of the technology itself, what has been your experience and can you share uh, some of what has worked and some tips for other startups and co-founders? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think for us, it, has, it was a very radical process. Um, We've been trying to solve this core problem of teams in an organization waiting on legal for the right. past three years. Um, and we first started with a programmatic approach, and it only really just got us that far. And then almost overnight, with the emergence of LLMs, this became a solvable problem. So at the end of last year, we actually scrapped our entire roadmap, and I would say almost 90% of our code base. Um, and started building a product almost from scratch. And it was like a very painful experience, um, but 100% the right ex way for us to go because we were now able, or we are now able to solve this problem that was unsolvable before. Um, and it also gave us the freedom to actually build a product. You know, every design decision, every product decision we made was informed and powered by this new technology. Um, and it just made it much more easily adoptable product that actually solved the customer pain point. And I think the two pieces of advice I would give people is, like, if this is going to make you solving the customer pain point like, that much easier, that much better, then you need to go all in. And you've got to kill your darlings a little bit if you have the competency in the team and if you also had, we were early stage enough to be able to do that. Um, and the second I would say is, like allow people to prototype 
Um, for example, we exposed all of our prompts to the entire organization, um, not just the engineering team. And it enabled us to iterate so much quicker um, because you know, the beauty of startups is that you, you ha you're, you're agile and with LLMs, it's language driven. Right. So it's not limited just to engineers. Yes, some of it is, but um, that was a complete game changer for our entire organization. Yeah, I mean, as you said, uh, generative AI, it, it seems to be a very transformative technology, yeah? Um, and it's fascinating that you were able to declare bankruptcy and, you know, go get rid of the technical debt. What about you um, with Ultimate? Like, how was, uh, what, what has been your experience, Sarah? Yeah, I mean, firstly, I think that's a really great question that you ask yourself at the start. Is generative AI going to be transformative for your product? Right. Or is it going to be incremental? And... If it's going to be incremental, it's a really low risk uh, thing that you're working with with your product roadmap. You know, you can test a lot of different technologies. You can decide to use something open source because it gets you live fast. And you probably don't care that GPT-4 is expensive and slow because your usage is going to be low because it's a little incremental addition. If it's going to be transformative, like it was for Lily, like it was for Ultimate, so we are, uh, like I mentioned, a customer service automation platform. So conversational AI is like the core, core technology. And so generative AI was just it, like an existential discussion for us. Uh, when it's going to be transformative, you face conversations at the start like, you know, do you want control over the technology? Do you want to be building your own LLM and building it all in-house? Or if you're a startup, which we both are, is time to market absolutely critical for you? In which case, are you going to be using open source, wrestling with something open source, while at the same time building a plan of action for taking it in-house long term? And I mean, for at Ultimate, we've spent the last six months, you know, wrestling with this and uh, essentially trying to put the genie back in the bottle. And it hasn't just been one thing that we've built, you know, it's hundreds of different optimizations, AI features, different tweaks in the whole AI pipeline to get this working. Because the truth is, when you're using open source and you've seen it yourselves, it's very, very easy to build for a developer to build a really cool demo, right? Which is about 80% of the way there. Um, but to get from that 80, 90% to 100%, something production grade, and in our case, that means an AI virtual agent that is honest, that stays in scope, that is controllable, um, that's, that's the Herculean effort. And so, I would say that my advice would be to assess the risk profile of your customer base, right? Are your customers going to be okay with a better product that has these kind of, that can go off piste um, while you work out the kinks? Or does it need to be production grade from day one? In which case you need to be taking on much bigger challenges and maybe bringing this tech in house. But I agree with Lily that if it's going to be transformative for your product, for your industry, then there's no time like the present. You need to be starting now and you should probably be thinking very ambitiously about how much resource you dedicate to this. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sarah. I'm going to come back to you both uh, because you both of you mentioned transformative. Uh, you know, yeah. we should talk about opportunities. But before that, Harpy, from a venture capital perspective, you know, as startups come to you or as you look at startups and their roadmaps, what are you seeing or, or what, what do you recommend as advice to other startups? I think two or three things. One is Gen AI is super fast moving, obviously. That's right. So the, the basic things around the right team in the right market with a solution that is 10x better, I think that's still equally as relevant as it was in the last 30, 50 years of, uh, of building startups. I think second is like you two talked about, I think you deeply thought about the customer experience and what generative AI is gonna do for you. I think we see a number of startups um, which are building this thin layer on top of open AI or whatever stack. Um, so I'd be thinking about the durability and defensibility of your value prop, especially as these general purpose foundation models get better. If you look at some of these copywriting um, companies out there, or maybe even creative and image generation type of uh, uh, companies out there, the general purpose model is just improving. And I think in two, three years, I would be worried about them eroding the value prop. So 
I think we like founders who, I think like Lily, you said, are not just sprinkling AI right. on top of the product. They've basically fundamentally rethought you know, what Gen AI means, thrown away 90% of your code, and have deep customer empathy for the problem space that you're attacking. I think the deep customer empathy meeting sort of a real transformational use case of Gen AI, I think that's, that's what creates sort of the magic here. Amazing. Um, you, you touched on one thing and the, the 90% from a developer standpoint, and I'm kind of going off script. So it's, it's important for us to talk about what is the role of a new age developer, right? So the technology is so new. You know, some of us who are used to the traditional style of software development, even, you know, agile, all these new things. Do you see that as companies as, um, as a strength versus, you know, an enterprise that might not have the flexibility or the, you know, the velocity to move fast? Do you look for that in a startup? Or so, sorry, just to rephrase the question, are you saying, are you looking for developers that have sort of the versatility? Or, or how should we be looking for, you know, recruiting and, you know, how should the engineering organizations be set up for taking advantage of what the speed of LLMs are, like generative AI? Yeah, this is all about iteration speed. I think uh, the beauty or the curse right. of, of this market is the same toolkit is available to everybody. Right. Right. And it's really how many experiments can you run in a finite amount of time? How much can you incorporate your customer feedback back into improving your models and improve the UX over time? So it's all about speed. So I think teams that are nimble are able to out-execute everybody are going to win. Got it. With a lot of these business models, there is, it's all about product and UX. There is no sort of deep proprietary mode, especially for some of the SaaS businesses. And as you look at it from a challenge and an sort of opportunities and challenges in this field, Sarah, how are you looking at it from an ultimate standpoint with generative AI? Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, it's widely agreed that customer service is one of the number one industries that's going to be disrupted by AI, especially with generative AI, with how human-like the experience can be. And so Ultimate really sits at the heart of that and we get, to, we get to witness it. And I mean, generative AI, once it's evolved a bit further, because the industry is quite rudimentary and the applications are, but once it's evolved a bit further, it will be used by companies like Ultimate to make it incredibly easy for support teams to deploy bots that work across channels, that work across languages, that work across systems. And that automates probably 80% of customer requests in a really human-like way. So for us in the next 12 to 18 months, it's going to make chatbots launch so much faster. It's going to make them much less effort to manage. You're not going to need to train or think about intent hierarchies ever again. It's just going to go live, right. which is just yeah awful for users right now. And finally, of course, the experience is going to be so much more human-like. It's going to be very hard to tell if you're speaking to a human or a machine. Yeah. Yeah, fascinating. Um, Lillian, same question, but from, from the industry that you are servicing towards more, you know, the legal regulatory environments where customers are more risk averse, they are worried about, you know, data privacy and, you know, other sort of considerations. How are you looking at it from AI helping you from an opportunities or, you know, what are some of the challenges you see? Yeah, so a hundred percent, right? We're dealing, our end users, our sales teams, our marketing teams, but the people who buy us and set us up and administrate the product are legal and compliance team. And if you give them an AI product, that's a black box they're not going to use it, right? Because they can't. Because if these bots are going to give uh, advice on how to negotiate with a customer, then it has to be accurate and it has to be secure. So from the very beginning, we're like, OK, well, we need to focus on making this AI explainable, steerable, auditable, um, and really put our focus into that. And that came with its challenges and also with its sacrifices, I would say. like. For example, we definitely sacrifice speed of response. Our, you know, our request, request takes about one to three minutes. Um, now, on the grand scheme of things, you know, teams are used to waiting for four hours, seven days, 30 days in certain enterprises, so two minutes is nothing. Uh, but it's slower than maybe you'd expect at first. But it's a sacrifice that everybody's willing to make. Um, so I think that's definitely uh, something that we looked into. And, but I think the beauty of it is that if you can build 
steerable, auditable, very secure AI, then these teams develop a huge amount of trust into the product and will deploy it very quick and very widely. And I've, you know, I've been in like legal tech for four years. I've never seen technology be deployed that fast or at that kind of scale ever before. And that's so cool to see. It's it's uh, it's interesting. You mentioned innovation, but more responsible innovation. I think that's that's the key, especially in yours. Uh, you are working across multiple uh, industry verticals, if I may say, uh, Harpy. Are you seeing any patterns, or what sort of trends are you seeing with respect to generative AI in each of these? Yeah. So, I think a couple of things on responsible innovation. I would just say the only st advantage that startups have is they can move fast. That's right. Yeah. So you can take risks that Google can't, that Procter & Gamble cannot. So I think it's okay to push the envelope. Um, I think the other, other couple of things we are seeing, um, I think marketing vaporware is powerful in this space. Right. So all the big companies and small companies are claiming everything. So I think as a startup, it's really difficult to differentiate yourself. So I think maniacal customer focus, getting the right case studies and so on, sort of really important to kind of break out from that noise level. Um, and third, we also see, I think, um, the bigger companies, I think in previous generations of innovation, you know, even if you look at AI and machine learning as it was deployed, I think the bigger companies weren't very well suited to do that. You know, General Motors couldn't attract the same talent that maybe Palantir could here. Um, so they, they weren't able to move as fast, but I think the toolkit here is somewhat, sort of so democratized that anybody can build a, build a POC and prototype and you know, put something up uh, within like 30 days, 90 days. It takes a while to get better at it. I totally agree with the comments here. It, our startups we've seen, it takes three to six months to fine tune the models and get them to actually work, but very easy to claim that you've got all this stuff. So I think as a startup, you gotta be nimble on the product, but you also gotta be very, very savvy on the go-to market. Yeah, this is, thank you. Uh, I think I want to be respectful of the time. So can we take maybe 45 seconds each and sort of provide your closing thoughts on, on how you are looking at this from and what would you advise your startup communities? Just go from Lillian all the way to Harpy. Sorry, can you repeat just that? To, just to your closing comment. On, okay, sorry, just, uh, from just the, addressing okay. the audience, yeah. Um, no, I mean, I think for, like, like I said, I think Gen AI for us was completely transformative. It's transformative for the entire product, who we sell to our market, the problems we're able to solve. Um, and I think it's so exciting to be working uh, kind of at the cutting ed edge of technology right now and actually defining the patterns also, right? Because this is such an untapped, opportunity. No one like knows what it's going to do to the industry. No one knows what it's going to do to legal. And it's exciting to be on that journey. Thank you. Yeah, I completely agree. I think it's an absolute gift. It's, I have had so many great years building Ultima. And I would say that this is the most exciting year we've had so far. And it's really down to the, the privilege of being able to play around with such a new technology. I would completely agree with Harpinder that it's all about speed. For us, we recognized that immediately it was all about launching something fast, getting something better out and listening to the customer feedback and building an organizational system internally where you can capture that feedback and iterate upon it incredibly quickly. We scrapped our product roadmap at the start of this year. We stopped working with product roadmaps entirely and we only worked with a sprint cycle. We scrapped full year goals and only worked with monthly goals. We've just readopted quarterly goals because we're able to see a little bit further ahead. That is the pace that you need to be moving at uh, to be able to keep up with what's going on. Yeah, the, I think in addition to speed, I think the only other thing I'd bring up is if you look at some of the previous waves like cloud and data and so on, I think we're in like the 15th year of cloud here, 18th right. year of cloud probably, and it's still not done. So I think this is going to take a while. So I think pick good long-term partners. I think speed is super important, but also be thinking about go to market, your act two, act three, and so on. I think there's gonna be some very large companies created over, uh, over the next sort of 20 years here. Well, three of you, thank you very much for your time. This was a really interesting discussion. It feels like a tectonic shift in technology here. And thank you all for being here. I know this is a busy day. The energy is palpable in the floor, um, you know, Congrats on all the innovation that you are driving. 
just a little bit. We'll be outside. I know we don't have time for Q&A, but we would be on our Google Cloud booth in D505. If you want to stop by, uh, ask us any questions. Uh, and good luck with your innovation and all, whatever you're like to do with AI. So thank you for being here.